Good morning. Can you hear me well? Good morning and welcome to the Dolly Museum. Thank you for being here today, joining us for Coffee with the Curator. We have a wonderful lecture today to celebrate Black History Month and then also our wonderful exhibit here at the museum. But before we go into that, I would like to thank our sponsor, the city of St. Petersburg. We can give them a round of applause. <laughs> also, a special thanks to our members who make events like this possible. Thank you. Another wonderful, special, grateful thanks to our other sponsors of the current exhibit, the Dolly and Impressionist Monet, Renoir, Degas, and more. Our presenting sponsor, Kane's Furniture. Our supporting sponsors, Kay and Joel Bronstein, Bronstein Betsy Schweitzer, Sandy Taroski, and David Zern, and Adele Visaggio. We have more, we have more. <laughs> and our airport sponsor, St. Pete Clearwater International Airport, and our hotel partner, the Vinoy Resort and Golf Club. Thank you. Please visit our website, thedolly.org, for more information about online activities and programming, including these upcoming events. Thursday, tomorrow, we have Poetry at the Dolly here in our theater. On the 14th, we have Art and Meditation in our theater. We also have, on Friday, one of our special events. They're all special, but this one's an After Dark special, <laughs> and it's our Valentine's Day edition, the Dolly Dome. Um, please go online for that. Uh, we still have tickets available, and it's a, it's a party. And on the 18th, Sunday, we have Yoga at the Dolly. Then we have story time at the Dolly, and we have Dilly Dally at the Dolly, and all of that. <laughs> and I'll be there for all of those events, so you'll see my wonderful face. <laughs> and on the 22nd, we have a perfume making workshop. We still have tickets available for that workshop. It's one of our first perfume workshops, so check it out. Also, the 24th, we have an amazing fashion show. If you were here Thursday, you got a sneak peek of the wonderful clothing from our um, fashion design at the Dolly program with our high school students. So please, 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 please come to this event and support our wonderful students who are working hard for their careers. And so that, that is our Dolly fashion show, uh, runway and award show at Gibbs High School, which I graduated from. <laughs> <laughs> Also, because of our um, Grand Prix that we have downtown, we will only be having our Coffee with the Curator next month virtually. So you can join us on um, our YouTube channel to view the stream live, well, not the live stream, but a recording of the Coffee with the Curator. And um, our membership manager, Megan Moyer, is giving this Coffee with the Curator. So if you call her up, you know exactly who she is. She will be speaking for Women's History Month. Muse, mu more than muses, the women who inspired their impressionists, and you know, there are many. <laughs> Be sure to follow us on our social media for the latest Dolly Museum happenings and Dolly inspired conversations. And before we get started with our lecture, I would like to welcome our speaker. Our speaker is Dr. Dallas Cooper Jackson, who was my principal in middle school at Thurgood Marshall. <laughs> and Dr. Dallas Jackson is a native of St. Petersburg, Florida, and he earned his bachelor's of fine arts and three educational degrees, his, educa his master's in education, his education doctorates, and he also received, um, he recently completed his MFA in painting at my alma mater of SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design. Uh, he, is a career, he is a career public servant of 30 years. He has maintained an art practice and has had many solo and group exhibitions in galleries and museums in the Tampa Bay area. He has worked in private and permanent, he has artwork in pr private and permanent museum collections as well. Dr. Dallas Jackson is also an arts consultant with the University of South Florida and has been awarded the National Endowment for Arts grant through Creative Pinellas to provide arts education and visually impaired students at Lighthouse in Pinellas County. He is 
an amazing artist, and I am inspired by him. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Dallas Cooper Jackson. Good morning. Before I get started, I want to say that Joy, I met Joy as a middle school student. She was a phenomenal and awesome artist, participating in all type of local arts events for, for middle and high school students. She went on to um, Gibbs High School, and then I ran into her one summer at the Morian Arts Center and found out that she was at SCAD, and she's a phenomenal artist, so you make certain you earmark that name because she is going places, and this is just the dawn of her career. So you're awesome. Uh, I want to take a quick moment and just acknowledge a group of um, students who are sitting virtually in a place I, where I sat 36 years ago at Southern University, there's a class that's in session at the, in the, the Fine Arts Department at Southern and they're attending live. And Professor Randall Henry is the professor there. Early in December, we had an opportunity to spend some time together um, when I was out there doing a presentation at Southern. And so he's got, uh, People, uh, young people that are sitting in class today, and I hope that this is, inspires them to see what life could look like some years down the road when they leave the institution. So I'm just giving a virtual shout out. So good morning. Those in, in attendance and those who are attending virtually. My presentation this morning is re resiliency, history, and when they collide. Um, keeping in, in, in the um, temper in the in the time of the Impressionist and Surrealist collection that's here exhibiting together with these Impressionists as well as Dolly. I'm also running a parallel discussion about African American history with a particular focus on the highwayman within this experience. To prepare for this um, presentation today, I went back and took a look at some of the timelines. So as I'm not gonna read all of this. I just put this up for visual effect. So the Impressionism period, which is the fourth on the timeline, and the Surrealism um, period, which is a little further down the road, all anchored together by Dali um, and his works and how he was inspired by the works that were done 20, 30 years before he became an artist and on the scene. Both of these, the Surrealist movement and the Impressionist movement had quite an impact on me. I expanded my research to look at, <laughs> I wanted to look deeper, and of course, as when you're in an uh, MFA program, research is the first thing along with practice. So I expanded this because I wanted to do a deeper dive to get a, clear understanding of where African-American art fit into the canons of art. And digging deep, I did not find any information in these expanded. So part of my presentation today is just to enlighten on the concurrent existence and development of art by African-American, African people in the same time frame. So that's a lot that's going on in, in the documentation of art history. And there was a, a perception that art is dead and art is no longer anything that will be able to continue in the future. And to the contrary, we have contemporary artists that are making that counter argument every single day. So to get started, I like to start with the basics of history in the United States. This quote by John Adams, for my research, set the tone for what you understand art to be in this newfound country, America. John Adams said, I must study politics and war so that my sons may have the liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. They said not to worry if that happens, it's coming back. My sons, my sons are to study mathematics and philosophy, geography, natural history, 
naval architecture, navigation, commerce, and agriculture in order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, architecture, statuary, tapestry, and porcelain. Now, what does that all mean to me as an art researcher is that our founding fathers of this country had this idea in mind that the aristocracy of a nation has been realized when art is center to its existence. Thus, the reason why we have institutions, museums that focus on visual performing arts. Now, concurrently, within my research, I look at our historical frameworks that impact, impact black artists. Now, I'm a descendant of families that come from South Carolina, so when I was looking at the black codes, a code noir in French, one thing that stuck out to me was no person of color could become an artisan, a mechanic, or shopkeeper. Now, these are dark historical moments in America but these, these moments tell us quite a bit about how we have developed to the modern country and civilization we are today. Now, the black coats were in effect, and this was, I would need days to go over the depths of that. But then in 1896, the Plessy versus Ferguson case became the, case, the law of the land and through Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal, under the common name Jim Crow laws, became the law of the land. And so when we think about what is the ideal development of the aristocracy, understood from one of the founding fathers, where he says that if we're going to get to the highest level two, three generations down the road, they should be able to study art and music. And when they do, that we have realized our national goal. Because remember, the forefathers are in an uncivilized land fighting the parent nation for independence. And so the ideal in the midst of war and fighting and trying to discover the identity of, its, of one nation, they already had a long-term plan that ended up with art. Okay. Now, I selected the highwaymen as one example, and there's many, many, many artists that we do not have the bandwidth of time and space to cover because I'm limited to one hour. <laughs> and so the highwaymen were very poignant in that they are, first of all, in Florida, and so am I. And their work, it took a while to to get realized, they were considered um, outcasts in a sense. But when you think about the Impressionists, the Impressionists came through in a time post the Romantic period. And the Romantic period was a very, very interesting time. Because when one think of Romanticism, you think of love and affection and the whole idea of romance, particularly when you think of friends. But the romantic period was chock full of artists that took on political quandaries of their time. Two main people that we could think about would be Theodore Jericho and the Raft of Medusa, and Eugene Delacroix, who painted Lady Liberty Leading the People. Those two works of art changed the political structure in France. And so by the time the Impressionists arrived, it had moved from the political work to a whole lot of religious iconographical work and commissioned work that, that lamented in history the aristocracy of the people who had in that time and period. And then comes along this group of trained painters, the Impressionists, who departed from what was perceived to be 
in the French art world, the appropriate art. They were, by one critic, and I, I apologize for not remembering the name, they call them a, a group of lunatics and a woman. <laughs> because their work departed from, their, their works departed from clearly defined works of art that had um, the intent and the idea of what was accepted at the time. The highwaymen who got their start between 1950 and 55 with a very small movement had a very similar type of happenstance going on. They um, were living in the land of Jim Crow, but there was a departure with them because in that point in time, African Americans in Florida were relegated to labor type of work. And just imagine the audacity of this, this small collective, it grew to 26, who decided we're going to depart from what would be normally expected or received well, and we're going to be artists. And from that, it's, it's amazing that there, there was not a way or a place that they can actually have formal exhibitions and get accepted into the art world. So the ingenuity and thinking, and as they say, mother necessity is the mother of invention, they started selling art on the side of the highway. So that's how they got the name of the Highwaymen. But their works, kind of can be, can be categorized as these. Freedom of expression, use of color and light, challenge established norms, subjective perspective. That is precisely the same characteristics you can apply to the Impressionists. Outdoor painting, unplain air, focus on atmosphere and mood, breaking from traditional style, entrepreneurial spirit, you know, when the Impressionists were rejected, they decided to have their own exhibitions. When the highwaymen could not be accepted, they went to the highway, highways and sold their artwork. And then something great was going on in our developing nation. People started coming to Florida for vacation to see the beautiful landscapes. And they would see these artists on the side of the road selling their artwork inexpensively. And that's how they got the attraction because, you know, with vacations being an annual experience, it started catching on. And so, so there's life. For those in the 50s, in a time where opportunity was relegated to very limited fields and op um, opportunities. The characteristics of a highway paint, of a highwayman painting, as you will see with impressionists when they're painting in on plain air, it's about aerial perspective, it's about the use of color. Now the Impressionists were preoccupied with light, it, light and is how it interacts with objects and how it set the, um, the environment. They were trained, they were, most of them were trained by a master painter. The, impre the um, highwaymen did not have formal training and this was intuitiveness, ingenuity, and as they would say in Mal Malcolm Gladwell's outlier, the 10,000 hour rule. You know, if you want to become an expert in anything, in anything 10,000 hours. And I would say that with 2,000 works and the 30 year span, that they clearly met that mark, particularly if that became their only occupation. Now the characteristics comparison to the Impressionists, Impressionist paintings. Of course, we have um, Alfred Sicily and um, Harold Newton. Harold Newton was one of the original, uh, one of the um, first Impressionists. Now, the way I like to pro approach analyzing a painting is I take it through the ICU. Not like the hospital, <laughs> but the <laughs> ICU, which in formal analysis of paintings, I like to start out with the intensity the complexity, and then the unity. 
Now the intensity, when I look at both the Impressionists, as, and I believe this painting is actually upstairs on, on the right, the, the Impressionist painting. The intensity is how the artist selected to use color to give the aerial perspective. And what's interesting about this, you got the trained and the untrained as far as being formally educated and trained in, in any type of art school. The complexity, it is not easy for someone to just pick up a paintbrush and just start painting. It takes you understanding color theory, depth. And when I look at it, do a, compar across a comparison of the two, that I see specifically in both of these works. And the unity. The unity expands just beyond just the painting we're looking at. It's how does the artist's work look in comparison to the entire movement all within their own collection. So the short of it is both movements, they were brilliant. And they have a lot of overlapping coincidences in their existence. And just, and just as a side note, the Impressionists were like 1850 to 1880 in that time frame, a little later. A hundred years later, the highwayman, 1950s to 1980s. You're talking about a hundred year difference, but there are so many parallels in, in their narratives of how they became to be how they came to be. So when I look at just the intensity and and the color, looking at the what's supposed to be the untrained painter and the trained painter, now one thing about the Impressionists, you can tell pedigree by the way painters paint. So you can, you can, I can see the, the formal training and analysis that they had to do in creating their own work. And so when I look at these complexities within each of these pieces, you know, that's the highwayman on, to your right, and that is the, one of the Impressionist paintings to your left. So I continue to try to look, to look across. I look at you know Monet, who was one of the um, key painters in the in, in the Impressionist movement. And I, when I look at these works side by side, I'm like, they had to put a lot of time into their work, both of them. Because when you're pl painting in plain air, we don't. They didn't have the luxury of having an iPhone where they could snapshot and take you back to the studio like most artists do today. We take photo reference. They had to go there and be there. Now the Impressionists were, were very, very particular when they painted, painted in plain air because light moves so fast that when you're out there working, if you start painting shadows and lights at 1 o'clock and you take a break and come back at 3 o'clock, all of that's changed. So their work requires an execution of skill in a short amount of time. And I imagine that the highwaymen had the same type of challenge. But also when you're dealing with dense ve vegetation, foreground, middle ground, background, there's an opportunity. I learned a lot from these artists. Now looking at some of Dolly's work. Now when I talk about intensity, I take this painting of the dollies on the left. Look at the lighting intensity in, and look at the highwayman intensity. Expert, and these are, you know, painters who were considered novice or just painting out of passion. And the reality is, is that if you're going to be an artist and really put that much time into it, you know you have economic challenges because life costs to live, and so to put that type of time in, I can only I, I can only imagine how difficult life had to be in order to put that type of time in, particularly in 1950, particularly being an African American, in a place that's not as advanced and developed as it is today. So that was a another. This is another one of the works of Dolly's that's upstairs on the exhibition. And let's just look, when you, the intensity, complexity, and unity you see in these night scenes, just how 
these artists both in their own way. And Dollar was very crafty in how he emulated the Impressionists. And I think that that built a strong foundation for what I call his high surrealist work. And just, and, and so, you know, when I look at this, I just, um, you know, Mr. Gibson's um, painting is just always amazing, to, knowing how difficult it is to paint, to see these works and, and to, to know that these artists existed almost anonymously in, in space and time. What was also a coincidence in, in the historical finding is each group had one female painter originally. I said earlier that with, with the first critic that talked about the Impressionists said the group of lunatics and a woman, at least they were respectful. They didn't say just a group of lunatics. They made certain a partition. But, and Morissette was one of the first, and I know we had Cassatt and others that joined the Impressionist movement later, but the thing that, oh, that stands out to me whenever I see this in history is that that took extra boldness, because when you have a male-dominated art institution and you're a female painter, they had more challenges. It's probably not documented, or we had to do re deep research. And then when I look at, you know, the highway men has one woman. It can be highway people, it's highway men. So I can't imagine Mary Ann Carroll's um, challenges and looks and stares of how are you doing this and why are you doing this. They overcame challenges, and I'm certain next month at the Women's History Month, I know there's going to be deep discussion about how women have been present throughout the arts. And it wasn't, it wasn't until 1970 with the guerrilla women that they really started railing against the male-dominated art institution. And to this day, we see still a gradual, but we've seen a, an explosion in acceptance of women in the arts. And so that is changing the culture of museums and it's making it more gender diverse. So just a quick collective of, of um, the um, highway men. They finally started getting their recognition in the 1990s. One collector made it a point to petition the state. And so they are in the Florida Hall of Fame as artists. And just think, they from 1950 to the 1980s, they did their work, but they did that work not, not just to get recognition. It became an economic engine for them. It was an entrepreneurial skill uh, um, um, agenda, but they did it for passion. And when you hear of passion, there's often sacrifices that comes along with the whole notion of passion. Some artists have patrons. If you look back at the Medici's and you look at Michelangelo and Raphael, all of those folks had people who were financially backing them. So worrying about Maslow's basic hierarchy of needs like food, clothing, and shelter wasn't the case in some of those situations. But these folks had to barter and do different things. Now, adding in the surrealism, surrealism, surrealism has impacted African and African American art in many ways over the years. Black futurism, Afrofuturism. I went to the National African American Museum of History and Culture in Washington, DC, and they have an Afrofuturism um, section. That is all, and I'm accusing it because I don't have any proof. I believe surrealism set the idea for that type of work because if you think about when surrealism came along, I mean, people were putting things that that didn't seem like they belonged together in the compositions. And of course, Dolly was the lead, but you had Max Ernst, you had Rene Magritte, you had a variety of people who, who were um, contributing to that. Now, in like, this is a picture of me in 1985 outside the Dolly Museum <laughs> with the art club from Northeast High School. <laughs> I have I've long been a fan of the Dolly Museum. 
I was in the National Art Artist Society. I was in the art club. I was in the French club. My mother's here in the audience, Miss Willie Jackson, 87 years old. So just a, a, a little something about my mother, I had to go to her because after I, was, after I went to the museum, I was like, I really got to go to Paris. I really want to go to France. I really, and my mother, it took some persuading, but I, I won her over and she let me go to Europe. She just had one demand. I can't go with my friends at Northeast High School. So she let me go to Europe with St. P. High um, a travel group, and she couldn't stop us from getting together because I ran into my friends in, from Northeast in Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> but my experience of coming to, to this museum piqued my interest so much in the arts, and I was already on the track to be an artist, prompted me to want to go to Paris because I wanted to go to the Louvre. I wanted to go to the Musée d'Orsay. I wanted to see all of this great art. I didn't have to worry about seeing surrealism because I had that right at home, less than five blocks from my house. Because I grew up less than five blocks from the old location. All right, so when I went off to college, I was, you know, 30 something years ago, and for those who are sitting in those seats at Southern that I've already give, given a, a greetings to, I was taught by Martin Payton on the right, and he studied under Charles White. Charles White was a Harlem Renaissance artist. And in 1935, during the Depression, Franklin Delano Roosevelt came up with this plan to get the, the flailing economy going by the, the WPA. Well, he was one of the artists who eventually ended up in New York, and he married Elizabeth Catlett. But anyway, this artist trained the artist that trained me. And so I didn't realize how big of an icon he was until a few years later when I started studying more about the Harlem Renaissance. But through him, and just showing you just how African-American art has impacted not only society, but me as well because when I was in class learning, I was totally unaware of the, histor the, the historical lineage that was, I was experiencing at that point in time. This is um, one of the paintings that um, Charles White um, did. And, this is, and he's done a series of, of, uh, of large scale uh, murals. And you'll see how, I don't know if it subconsciously happened, but you'll see my work a little bit later and see why these connect. This is Mr. Payton who had who studied painting and drawing, and he is a construction, a sculpture, construction, welding artist, and he moved into this, and he taught me how to weld and do sculpture as well. And so, oh, as a side note, this, this slide is a little bit out of place. 98 years ago this day, Dr. Carter G. Woodson introduced Negro History Week, and that was actually at the African American Fraternity Omega Sci Fi's annual conference, he introduced this as an idea and concept. So I don't know if this was planned, but the timing couldn't be great and it put more pressure on me because this day, 98 years ago, African American history was started. Yeah. So. so the residual effects of my experience with this is my drawing, sculpture. And in the center, I'm in a, a new studio space that we have received a grant through the National Endowment for the Arts to mentor emerging artists. So we're going to be running three residencies through the year. So I, I go in and I do work, and then we promote them to do work, and we help them do exhibitions and things of that nature. The impact of African American art has definitely come through me and made me the artist that just not that's not just in the business of creating, but also I am trying to reach out and make sure and I bring other artists along. And also continuing doing research because we have a lot of undiscovered talent and time in the same timeline that we're skipping through so quickly with the limit of time. 
So when you saw the other painting from um, Charles White, this is a painting I did for the Dr. Carter G. Woodson African American Museum, From the Slave Ship to the Spaceship and Beyond, African American History. I do large um, narrative paintings along with other things like drawing. So I was too impressed and, and inspired by um, the Impressionist. I've been there a few times to the Musée d'Orsay to see their works and when I could see them like at the High Art Museum in, um, in Atlanta or when I've seen them here at the Museum of Fine Arts. And I'm not, the reason why I can appreciate how much work goes into it because I, I wouldn't say that I'm the best landscape <laughs> painter but I did give it a try, and I do do landscapes periodically. And one of them, um, a dear friend of mine is, who's a, a lawyer, has a practice about two or three blocks from here. All of these paintings are in her um, law office here in downtown St. Petersburg. But um, looking at the Impressionists and looking at how they apply light, really, it, it's impacted me across the board. Now, also being a Dolly fan, I have done a series of works over the years that would that are surreal in their in their own way, and so as an artist trying to find your way, you you know I don't stay on one research agenda. I go and I explore, and art is about exploration and about attempting attempting new things. And then you could tell as time went on, I would become more Dali-esque as the more I spend time with him and I see the motion and the intensity in, in his work. And so, um, you know, these paintings are all tucked away because I moved deeper into my research agenda, but maybe I'll have some large exhibition one day and pull these out. But when I was thinking about what I would speak about today, just want you to know, just wanted you to see how the Dali surrealism and the impressionists have impacted me and my work and my whole perception of the art world. Now, some of my more recent works, I did a, a, an exhibition in October called Extirpation, Cl Color, Class, and Currency. Now, I love when I learn new things. I was actually doing some consulting work and I attended a workshop with a marine biologist who's also a flutist. And she got into talking about extinction. But, she, but in sea life, when they're, when they're doing their research, they, can, they categorize the, the exiting or the non-existence of species in the area as extirpation. And extirpation means that it's extinct, but it exists other places in the world. So when I really thought about that. I said, you know, that's going to be the title of my ex exhibition. Because my research is not just only about African American life, the African American experience, but it also talks about economic, social conditions, and opportunity. I mean, our nation is dependent, critically dependent, on the ideals of opportunity for all. I mean, we live in today in a society where Boston, Bangladesh, Bangladesh, and Beijing are all next door neighbors. There's a flattening of technology. You can connect with these around the world in a matter of seconds. So it's important for our generation, and this is where a 30-year educator now creeps into this presentation. Because when I see people like Joy, who move on to be successful, and when I hear about other um, young people that I've worked with doing their matriculation in school, that they're thriving and doing well, that's promising for tomorrow. And when I look at our interdependence within our country and just how we hit pockets of time, particularly right after, after the pandemic, we have so much partitioning and so much discord and it's alarming to me as an artist because I'm, I'm thinking, how is it the entire world was shut down in this pandemic? And we came together for a while. We were empathetic. 
we were cheering on the, the first responders and the, and the essential workers. We were following orders and staying home. We were wearing our masks. We were building what is really needed in this current time. And then we wake up one day, it's over. <laughs> Pandemic's over, COVID's gone, which it's not. <laughs> and I have personal knowledge that, that, that that's not gone. But when I think about that, in this point in time, we are in trouble as a, as a society and civilization. Because now you hear global discord, you have wars, you have people who are you know, pushing for nuclear response to human crises. And in my research as a consultant, we are working to make certain that art is a part of education because art teaches empathy. It teaches self-awareness. It builds where people are not developed. And so through this $8.5 million grant with, um, with USF, we are building capacity. And we are working in struggling schools, underperforming schools, in the city, pockets all over the world, all over the country. And the goal is to really save society, to save humanity. So these works, which um, in that, in that um, collection of work, I borrowed from, on the right, the Raft of Medusa, Theodore Jericho's. And by the way, that narrative and that story is about arrogance, favoritism, political privilege in France. The, there was a raft, and the raft was a place where the poor, the downtrodden, the workers own a frigate, which is a warship, which was used to transport French arist you know, nobility as well as workers to Senegal on the west coast of Africa. The ship captain was not the best captain, but was selected for political reasons. And so the result of that was they had to abandon ship. And it was a simple math mistake. If you have a warship and you have cannons, you should get rid of the cannons if you're trying to sail. Well, right off the coast of Africa, the boat actually hit a sandbar. It was a weight issue. But a skilled captain would have known that. Well, so they have lifeboats on the boats, because you know, all lifeboats have boats. But those who are the nobility or the affluent class were able to get on the boats, and they went to shore in a matter of hours, if not within a day. Whereas those who were maintaining the boat and making certain it kept moving, they were left to the device of scrap wood that was a makeshift raft. And there were 150 people originally on that raft. And at the conclusion of the, at, they stayed at sea at, for three weeks, and at the conclusion of the three weeks, only 15 people survived. Now, Theodore Jericho, artist, became obsessed with documenting that event. And when this painting um, was revealed in Paris, that ended the aristocracy. That changed the whole political structure. So when I look at our poverty class, this painting symbolizes that warning that if we don't take care of the people we depend on and live on in this closed society, that there could ultimately be unfavorable outcomes. And the other is to just show that, you know, in, in, in mid-century, 20th century, a person that went from being property can actually be free to live like human beings. Now, the current work that I'm working on, and I just received notification that I was accepted into the Skyway 2024 Triennial Art Exhibition this summer. Part of my research that um, I've been doing over the last few years was about some of the points in time in history that are now seemed like 
they are being rewritten, or maybe it's not enough room in a chapter to include them, so they may be excluded. So my art agenda is to make certain that these historical moments that are very poignant and very important have an opportunity to be, if it's not in history books, if it's not being taught in classes, it can at least be hanging up in museums or galleries or in collections. So this, these two works are just uh, um, small examples. Well, they're, not, they're large scale works, but this is about the Tulsa, o Oklahoma massacre of 1921. And then, you know, because I look at the point in time in history, we're in the throes of Jim Crow. Those, those young men just came back from fighting World War I, defending their country. It was separate but equal in America. And Greenwood, that little community in Tulsa, Oklahoma, started thriving. Prosperity, interdependence, community. But it was always a tinderbox. And it took one episode that pushed over the line of demarcation that led to 300 people being killed and an entire city being wiped out. And from 1870 to well into the mid-20th century, these occurrences happen. And we're currently working on the Rosewood and the Okoye incidences in Florida. Massacres. And my hope and intention not to make people feel bad, because I don't think anybody in this room was around during that time, correct? But if we don't examine our historical perspective, we certainly can't do anything to make sure it doesn't happen again. I would quote Maya Angelou's poem, but her poem is complex. Read the poem on the pulse of morning, brilliant. She sends a message to mankind through a rock, a river, and a tree, and she speaks to these very quandaries we're dealing with in 2024. So, yep, Skyway contemporary art. So in closing, you know, my entire work is focused on reigniting humanity. We have artists who contribute every day. One thing um, that I discovered in my research that, that um, museums are now in a day of reckoning. Museums are filled with artifacts that were spoils of war, that was taken during times of destruction. And I read an article in the New York Times, because my mother makes it, and I have that every Sunday. It said, Indiana Jones, days are over. Countries and nations are calling for their artifacts. The spoils of war to be returned home. And for me, what that means is that, you know, I love going to the Louvre, but I saw a whole lot of Egyptian sculpture, and I'm certain they got room in Alexandria and Cairo to house that stuff. So that's sad in one respect, but you know what's promising is that when those artifacts do go home, that creates room and capacity for the art that's not been included in the canons, going back, going back to my timeline, the art, the art that has not been added to research and all, maybe they can make room in the museums for the people we've ignored, ignored here. So the bottom line is about humanity. We, and so, when I look at the Impressionists and when I look at the Surrealists, phenomenal collection of works. They, they, they have curated an excellent exhibition here. But I also look at and I think about the Highwaymen, who works, they've created over 2,000 works that's scattered. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, you can't even document the number of times tourists travel down from the north, down US 1, Long before it became, you know, South Beach and all of this, you know, re resorts and highways, 
and they would just pick up this artwork for a small price of souvenirs to take back. I don't know if it gives. So somewhere in, in the north, you have probably in estates and homes and attics, valuable work done by people who were passionate about their work. And my hope, as if, as with the times they had found Picasso's and they had found Gauguin work in yard sales or in obscure places, I'm hoping that one day that all of these obscure pieces actually make it to the canons and into these institutions where they're sending back the work that was the spoils of war. So at this point, I'll open up for discussion and questions. Okay, thank you. We're going we're gonna to come around with the microphones so that the people who are joining us um, virtually will be able to hear your questions as well as um, Dr. Jackson's answers. Well, thanks for coming today and touching on just like a whole bunch of really important topics. And I just want to thank you for all this hard work you're doing to really make a better future. But I have a question for you. You're talking about the highwaymen and relating it to the Impressionists. We know a little bit about the Impressionist lifestyle and how these guys would hop on a train, go to the countryside together and paint, and then hang out at the cafes and talk about their art. I'm wondering, with respect to the highwaymen, do we know about their lifestyles and how far away they went to do their painting? Did they go together? Did they get together and discuss their work? So do we, do we have a sense of that information? Well, what I've, what I've found in my research is that they were pretty remote. They, were, they did not venture very far from their homes. And I would speculate that that probably was a good thing in the time of Jim Crow, because you had sundown towns, you had segregated communities, but the, but the thing that they had that was their advantage is that they had natural landscapes close in proximity to where they were. So I would not imagine that they traveled very far. So, got another, we have another question right there, Joy. Thanks very much. I agree with a lot of what you said. I would love to challenge you one day on some of the things you said. Okay. Um, what is the, can you tell us a little bit about the Skyway? Is it collaboration that you said that you've been accepted into? Yes, the Skyway collaboration is a trian triennial exhibition. That it's in its third iteration. First one was in 2017. And it's a collaboration between the Museum of Fine Arts, the Tampa Museum of Art, the Ringling Museum, the Contemporary Museum at the University of South Florida, and this one I'm missing. But with this collaboration, the curators at, that, at those museums screened 300 um, applicants, and they selected 62 to exhibit in one of the five museums. I found out I was dis I was accepted a couple weeks ago, but it wasn't until this week I found out specifically where. And I'm going to be at the Tampa Museum of Art. So, thank you. So, that was really interesting because I because they kept that from the artists because they have made an internal decision of how they want to spread this. Um, exhibition across the museums in the Tampa Bay area. So they call it the Skyway 2024 because that is the connecting to connecting highway to all of the museums. So it's uh, it's, it's going to be an interesting. This is my first time ever participating in it, so it's going to be interesting. We have another. I'm coming with the microphone. Yes. I noticed you didn't mention anything about abstract art. I mean, is that currently a going concern in African American art, or is it still, you know, mostly realism? Okay. Um. Good question. Questions about um abstract art across African. American, black, uh, the African diaspora art, 
you will see, not in a linear manner like surrealism or Dadaism or phobism or abstract. Abstract comes and goes in cyclical experiences with artists. So therefore, in modern contemporary art, you will see abstract. And when I took a look at African-American art through the early 20th century, even through the Harlem Renaissance, I mean, that was, it was, in that, and that was the period of time that abstract art was starting to get its footing. It was prevalent in some works. It depends on what the artist is trying to communicate. But abstract art, even to current time, you have, we have contemporary um, abstract painters. So um, we, we, I don't see a linear um, documentation of it. I just, I know I'm not good at abstract art. <laughs> So I do not um, ever try that as a skill, but we have several African American artists that do that do that particular style of art as a regular practice. So we we need more we we, we need more time and attention on capturing and documenting um, the various art styles, but they're impacted by the movements, and so you know that's actually a nod to museums to the research and to the institutions that John Adams talked about, because that means we have arrived at that society where it is promoted. And when I look at African-American art, culture, and experience, we are a reflection and reverberation of the art movements here in, um, in contemporary times. Uh, I'm curious, to me the term highwayman has some negative connotations, and I'm wondering if that lines up with some of the cultural ideas of the time, not just with these people who are going against typical you know, job opportunities, I guess, but also going outside of the art world's norm. Like, culturally, was that intended to be that way, or? Yes. I believe that you know a lot of names derive from the idea of disparagement or dismissal or or lack of a sophisticated term poking fun at people. I mean, you think about impressionism. Impressionism, and you know, they couldn't say, "Well, this is the lunatic and the woman movement," so they say impressionism. But impressionism, when you think about, you know a high fine art society, they didn't approach it as, well, these are the impressionists. It's probably, it's those impressionists. Now, just imagine how many people were probably irritated going up and down the road seeing this car parked person. They didn't have easels, and they didn't have like a reception area and tents where you can come in and, and, and enjoy the art, then make a decision. No, they probably had it lean up against their cars, and can you imagine that probably looked very unattractive to those who are, didn't have open mind to it. So I would, I would venture to say they probably say, well, there goes those highway men again. Who's who's out there? Those highway men. You know that that speaks to humanity. That a lot of our name, even you know, I believe the movie Dadaism is, you know, a disparaging remark about um, that movement, saying that it kind of emulates the sound a baby makes, da, 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 you know. It's so most names come from that, and certainly the highwayman was one of them, yeah. But now it's revered because you say that now, like the impressionists and highwaymen. And I'm certain that the surrealist also, you know, I'm not the, the best worst method, but when I think of sir meaning under in French and real, under real is that doesn't sound very positive to me as well, but now it's a formidable and accepted movement. Yeah. So thank you. And um well if there are no more questions, then um I would like people to please join me in giving another hand to Dr. Jackson and I'm sure he'll be available after. Thank you.
shy people can come up after and ask their questions. Uh, now, I also want to um, you know, mention a, a gentleman here. He's the retired art educator, Mr. Hines, Mr. Peter Hines. Um, a little story about him. I, it took me a year to actually coax him out of another middle school to come and teach the thousands of kids he taught when I worked with him at Thurgood Marshall when I was a principal. But he also had the opportunity to teach my two children, Dahlia and Dacia, who are sitting in the audience as well. And he went on to let them volunteer with him as he taught others through the years. But Mr. Hines is a you know career art educator that he's one of those silent people that makes it happen every day. And I've witnessed him take care of the lives of many, many students who've gone on to graduate from Yale, you name it, all over, the, all, all over the country, all over the world. And one thing about educators is that we don't get our roses or do, not unless you are a big name. And, and when I think about art, he was, he's, he was really a stable force in uh, my school. And you know we expanded the art program, so I just want to give a nod to him. And also I have my wife, Dr. Katie and Jackson, my son. My son, Dallas Anthony Jackson, not Cooper. And of course, Dolly and Daisy Jackson, and then my sister, a retired educator at 31 years, Deborah Jackson, she's here, and my mother. Who I can't wait to get my critique from mom. <laughs> But she's a retired educator as well, so come from a long family of family servants, uh, of public educators. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you.